This is the Energy Education Podcast for February 3rd, 2013. I'm Kevin Hurley. This week, we'll talk about the recent cyber attacks that were launched against the Fairwinds web servers. We'll discuss what we know and what we don't know. Also, we'll talk about a double standard that's applied to the nuclear workforce, why some employees are being treated differently, and why the punishment doesn't always fit the crime. Later on the show, we'll discuss a leak at Japan's Hamoka plant. A saltwater leak into the reactor was believed to be the first event of its kind. However, Arnie's here to share his experiences with that same problem at Millstone One decades ago. So today we're doing something a little bit different. We have uh, Arnie Gunderson on, as always, and Maggie Gunderson, the founder of uh, Fairwinds Energy Education. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea, Maggie, to bring you on following the uh, little incident we had this week. Yeah, that was quite a surprise to have a distributed denial of service attack, have a malware attack. I'm beginning to get a handle on what happened when our website was brought down. And I'd really appreciate it if you'd explain to our listeners more about it, since that's your technical end of things. From what I understand, we were attacked by something called a fragmentation attack, where rather than a computer opening a full connection with our web server, it sends malformed data and overloads the uh, part of the server that sets up the connections. So unfortunately, we don't have much information about where the attack came from or you know who might be behind it but certainly we're you know taking steps to make it so that can't happen again as best we can well thank you and i'd especially like to thank the server server managers and owners because they just did an amazing job of getting us back online and so did the team working with you in a very short amount of time so thank you kevin Oh, no doubt. They, I think we gave them quite a busy day. You know, I spent uh, probably uh, a grand total of two hours on the phone with them. And, um, you know, it's definitely worth pointing out when people or whoever, um, you know, launch an attack like this, since we are on a shared server with other web pages, this didn't just affect our web page. This affected other web pages on the box. So, or on the uh, same server that we sit on. So, um, you know, it wasn't, it really wasn't just us, and they were really great, and they haven't uh, kicked us out of the house yet. So, uh, all good news so far. Well, that sounds excellent. Um, it was interesting for me to read this week that the New York Times had also been under ta attack by a, a wholly different group, or, you know, and, and it's, it's one of the flaws of open internet and technology, but I don't want to see a closed internet either. Well, I guess we should let Arnie join the conversation too, you think? <laughs> well, you know, Kevin, hi. Thanks for having us again. You know, the, uh, what, what interests me about this is that the, uh, the other engineer I work with, a guy named John Large in England, uh, had his servers attacked uh, about two weeks ago also. And the only thing the two of us have in common is that we're both working on the San Onofre plant. Well, what a coincidence. I want to, though, get into what the point of our show was meant to be. Um, and I also want to apologize to the listeners. We didn't have a podcast last week. We delayed our podcast, and we delayed it long enough for the server to go down. So uh, our apologies to the viewers, to the listeners, for not having a podcast last week. The topic of this week's podcast is the double standard uh, in nuclear power plant working environments. Why are some nuclear plant workers being treated differently than the nuclear plant higher-ups when they do something wrong? Arnie, if you could start out, I know you have several, but if you could start out with one example of uh, something that happened to an Oyster Creek employee. Yeah, just this week, and uh, a person on the Oyster Creek staff, uh, not in the senior management, but you know somebody working his way up through the ranks, um, was uh, was terminated um, because the um, because of something the person did way back uh, almost a decade ago. Th this person had a uh, had a, a DWI, 
and didn't report that to his management way back a decade ago when it happened. Um, ultimately, he did, but it was a long time in between when it happened. And that shouldn't happen. You know, you're supposed to report these things. There's no doubt the employee was wrong a decade ago when he uh, didn't report it. But what happened now is that the NRC convened a, um, a full-blown process and then decided that this person should, uh, uh, should not be allowed to work at Oyster Creek um, because of, uh, of a mistake the person made 10 years ago. And that's their policy. Now, I'm okay with that. The, the person didn't tell the truth, and, and nuclear, you're supposed to be truthful. But there's really a double standard at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You know, they, cre they treat the people in the organization below senior management to one standard, to one very tough standard, whereas the senior managers get off the hook for doing things, in, in fact, far, far worse. Let, let me give you an example. Just about the same time this employee was having his DWI, uh, the plant out in uh, Ohio near Toledo, the davis Bessey plant, had um, a near miss. The uh, nuclear reactor rotted through, so there was, instead of eight inches of steel, there was only about a quarter inch of steel left. And when you say a near miss, you mean almost a meltdown. Yes, it would have been, had the plant run about another month, um, it would have been a meltdown right outside of Toledo. Toledo. So this was serious. Now, there were all sorts of, um, of warnings that management overlooked. And um, management overlooked them because they wanted to keep the plant running until the next refueling outage. They were making money all winter long when, they could, uh, when the uh, cost of electricity was the highest and their profits were the highest. So management was overlooking all of these signs. Then what happened was when the, uh, when the flaw was finally discovered, the NRC turned its guns not at the management, but at one engineer in the organization who didn't check one box on one procedure. And that en engineer was drummed out of the industry in a, in a federal trial. Yet the, no manager at davis Bessey was even indicted, let alone sent to prison. Now, Davis Bessie had to pay a multi-million dollar fine. There's no doubt about it. But, you know, that's chump change to these guys. When you put a manager in a situation where he goes to jail, then I'll believe that the NRC doesn't have a double standard. So the situation at Davis Bessie uh, basically boils down to the fact that they were warned about this uh, that it may be a problem. They decided to continue, and then when there was a problem, they let the head of one of their loyal workers roll rather than taking the fall for themselves at the management level. Yeah, and I, I wonder, too, why, why weren't they penalized for what it cost the ratepayers? I mean, how long was Davis Bessie shut down, Arnie, and how much, you know, did that cost their ratepayers? Oh, yeah, you know, they... That, that the company suffered is, is no doubt. But did they suffer adequately for the fact that they jeopardized the entire Midwest? Not in my opinion, they didn't. And it begins when managers know they can go to jail, then things change. You know, the NRC has never put a senior manager um, in, in jail for any kind of a, a misdeed related to operating a nuclear power plant. You know, Davis Bessie's example number one, but there's a lot of other examples out there. Yeah, the one example that I that I know of personally, a woman that I know who brought a, a lot, a lot of safety concerns forward for a number of years to safety concerns about a nuclear plant in her community, and she brought it forward to the community. She brought them forward to the NRC, to her state legislature, and she was very active in trying to have the plant operated safely and have it follow its own regulations. And one of the key officers, I think he was an executive vice president of nuclear at that particular company, put his sights on getting rid of her. And so he called her boss at the company, you know, where she worked. She worked for an entirely different firm, no connection, and he called her boss boss to boss, you know, upper management to upper management. 
and proceeded to advise her boss that he should fire her and that she was irresponsible and vindictive. But of course, that had nothing to do with her job at her own company. He knew nothing about her performance at her own company. He was trying to um, stop her from having the resources to be an activist, I suppose. Yes, yes. And, and she was not what I would call anti-nuclear. She was what I would call pro-safety. And she wanted the nuclear plant run safely and for it to follow its regulations. So this uh, executive vice president called her boss, and he didn't know because she had one last name and her boss had another last name that the president of the company uh, where she was employed was her brother. And it was a family family business that they had taken over and, and, and both had key roles within the company. So her brother went to the NRC with the allegations and proof of exactly what happened. And this executive vice president wasn't fired, wasn't put in jail, wasn't, n- nothing happened to him. Instead, he was just quietly allowed to resign, get his pension, and go about his life, you know, as, as if it was normal. You know, so what brought this whole conversation up was what happened to this this poor engineer out at the uh, Oyster Creek plant. So here's a guy who loses his career because of uh, not reporting a DWI in a timely fashion, and yet we've got executives at Davis Bessie and executives at the company Maggie talked about who just get a walk. They get their pensions, they get their retirements, and in some cases they even keep their jobs. So... Um, that's what we we meant by the fact that there's definitely a double standard. Management, senior management, with lawyers to fight the NRC, gets off the hook, whereas the low-level employees are on the hook. And and that's no surprise to me. I mean, the NRC does it with their own. And at a, at another date, I'd, I'd love to do a whole show with you about the NRC and an inspector general investigation that found out about an NRC executive who lied under oath, who covered up an investigation, who was proven to be to to neglect the investigation and and issue and cause a cover up, and he was given a promotion, several for fact, and um, you know continued his hundred and fifty thousand dollar a year salary until his retirement. I mean, it's just outrageous. And now that NRC executive is now working for the nuclear industry, uh, arguing that uh, almost every plant that he uh, is brought in on is uh, more than safe enough to continue operating. All right, well, let's make things a little bit more technical now. Arnie, the word saltwater intrusion has recently come up in nuclear news, and It's a little vague for me. I don't find myself understanding what that means. Can you explain to me what is a saltwater intrusion and why is it in the news? Uh, Yeah, that's a great term of uh, the nuclear industry designed to to obfuscate what really happened. The Hamoaka plant in Japan had a leak in the condenser. The condenser is what separates the ocean from the nuclear coolant and it's what cools the turbine and normally there's pipes that separate the two well that Hamoaka the um, uh, the pipe broke and clean salt water so non-radioactive salt water came into the nuclear reactor so much salt water came in that the nuclear reactor um, had to shut down likely permanently well what happened was that this was this story was covered about 18 months ago, uh, and the Japanese press said it had uh, never happened before. And I read the story, and I said, that's baloney. I know it had happened before because I was an engineer back in the 70s when it happened. So I contacted the guy who wrote the story, and I explained to him that it had happened at Millstone Unit 1 back in 1972. And one of the things I did was I developed three coupled 
partial differential equations to explain how this accident happened. It took me a month to write three equations, and then we modeled it on a supercomputer and, and, and solved it. But I wrote the report back on Millstone, this is in the 70s, and this is back in the days of typewriters. And I, I had the secretary type out that on, uh, in 1972, the Millstone plant experienced a, quote, serious saltwater leak. Well, my boss saw the report, loved the analysis, but he made the secretary retype the front page and he changed, quote, serious saltwater leak to, quote, a saltwater intrusion. So that's where the term comes from. Arnie Gunderson was, uh, uh, was the first to put it in a type memo because his boss changed the term serious saltwater leak. To what salt did you think water. at the time? I didn't even blink an eye. It's part of the... Uh, propaganda that you begin to accept when you're in the nuclear industry. You know, you all begin to speak the same way. So it was just my first lesson in nuke speak, if you will. So what happened after that was that the uh, that plant was shut down for a year, and it was nowhere near as serious a leak as what happened at Homoka. But apparently, nobody told the Japanese that a reactor like that could have a leak, and if the leak happened. Uh, was likely to do some real serious damage. Salt water and uh, stainless steel do not get along well at all. And uh, anybody who's ever had a boat on the ocean would know that the stainless steel gets pretty well damaged. And, of course, the stainless in a nuclear reactor is at 500 degrees. So Hamoga shut down, but they had no knowledge that it had ever happened before, nor had the Japanese regulator, until I contacted the reporter, and the reporter got me talking with the regulators and the uh, people at Homoka and explaining the situation. So finally, as a result of my involvement, uh, the Japanese regulator and the people from Homoka sent a delegation over to the NRC, and they found the old typewritten reports that I had developed, um, which were instrumental in them determining that Homoka probably could never be started up again. I was really surprised at, at this whole chain of events as, as it unfolded because the utilities, energy companies have owners groups that meet on specific model plants and, suppose, and, and they're international. So supposedly these owner groups are supposed to get together, have technical discussions, share technical papers, and bring up any engineering uh, safety or reliability flaws that they find and discuss it and look for technical solutions together, and that's just not happening. You know, this all makes me think of uh, our webpage, actually, how all of the content that goes into our webpage is uh, connected with keywords and meta tags. It would seem that uh, it might be possible for uh, the regulators of various nations and the uh, you know international nuclear authorities to have this sort of information in a database. So perhaps they could just type in saltwater intrusion and say, oh, well, here's a memo from 1972 uh, by Gunderson. Um, but, uh, I, I, I guess it's not that easy for them. I, I think you're absolutely right. The nuclear industry should pay a little more attention to what goes on on the Fairwind site. And maybe they'd actually learn a couple technical lessons. Uh, that doesn't seem to happen very often. All right. Well, I guess that will do it for this